Hey guys, for World Read Aloud Day today, I'm going to read to you from Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. I suppose there's a time in practically every young boy's life when he's affected by that wonderful disease of puppy love. I don't mean the kind a boy has for a pretty little girl that lives down the road. I mean the real kind, the kind that has four small feet and a wiggly tail, sharp little teeth that can gnaw on a boy's finger, the kind a boy can romp and play with and eat and sleep with. I was 10 years old when I first became infected with that terrible disease. I'm sure no boy in the world had it worse than I did. It's not easy for a young boy to want a dog and not be able to have one. It starts gnawing at his heart and gets all mixed up in his dreams. It gets worse and worse until finally it becomes almost unbearable. If my dog wanting had been that of an ordinary boy, I'm sure my mother and father would have gotten me a puppy. But my wants were different. I didn't want just one dog, I wanted two, and not just any kind of dog. They had to be a special kind and a special breed. I had to have some dogs. I went to my father and had a talk with him. He scratched his head and thought it over. Well, Billy, he said, I heard that old man Hatfield's collie's going to have pups. I'm sure I can get one of them for you. He may as well have poured cold water on me. Papa, I said, I don't want an old collie dog. I want hounds, coon hounds, and I want two of them. I could tell by the look on his face that he wanted to help me, but couldn't. He said, Billy, those kind of dogs cost money, and that's something we don't have right now. Maybe someday, when we can afford it, you can have them, but not right now. I didn't give up. After my talk with Papa, I went to Mama. I fared no better there. Right off, she said I was too young to be hunting with hounds. Besides, a hunter needed a gun, and that was one thing I couldn't have. Not until I was 21, anyway. I couldn't understand it. There I was, sitting right in the middle of the finest hunting, hunting country in the world, and I didn't even have a dog. Our home was in a beautiful valley far back in the rugged Ozarks. The country was new and sparsely settled. The land we lived on was Cherokee land, allotted to my mother because of the Cherokee blood that flowed in her veins. It lay in a strip from the foothills of the mountains to the banks of the Illinois River in northeastern Oklahoma. The land was rich, black, and fertile. Papa said it would grow hair on a cross-cut saw. He was the first man to stick the cold steel of a point of a turning plow into the soil. Mama had picked the spot for a log house. It nestled at the edge of the foothills in the mouth of a small canyon and was surrounded by a grove of huge red oaks. Behind our house, one could see for miles and miles of the mighty Ozarks. In the spring, the aromatic scent of wildflowers, redbuds, pawpaws, and dogwoods drifting on the wind currents spread over the valley and around our home. Below our fields, twisting and winding, ran the clear blue water of the Illinois River. The banks were cool and shady. The rich bottom land near the river was stubbed with tall sycamores, birches, and box elders. To a ten-year-old country boy, it was the most beautiful place in the whole wide world, and I took advantage of it all. I roamed the hills and the river bottoms. I knew every game trail in the thick cane breaks, every animal track that was pressed in the mud along the river banks. The ones that fascinated me the most were the baby-like tracks of a river coon. I'd lie for hours examining them. Before leaving, I'd take a switch and sweep them all away. Then I called my trail looks. The next day, I'd hurry back, and sure enough, nine times out of ten, there was clean-swept ground, and I would again find the tracks of the ring-tail coon. I knew he'd passed over that trail during the night. I'd close my eyes and almost see him, humped up and waddling along, fishing under the banks with his delicate little paws for crawfish and minnows. I was a hunter from time I could walk. I caught lizards on the rail fences, rats in the corn cribs, frogs in the little creek that ran through the fields. I was a young Daniel Boone. As the days passed and the dog-wanting disease grew worse, I began to see dogs in my sleep and went back to my father and my mother. It was the same old story. Good hounds cost money and they didn't have it. My dog wanting became so bad I began to lose weight and my food didn't taste good anymore. Mama noticed this and she had to talk with Papa. You're going to have to do something, she said. I never saw a, saw a boy grieve like that. It's not right. Not right at all. I know, said Papa, and I feel just as badly as you do, but what can I do? You know we don't have that kind of money. I don't care, said Mama. You've got to do something. I can't stand to see him cry like that. Besides, he's getting to be a problem. I can't get my work done. He follows me around all day long, begging for hounds. I offered to get him a dog, said Papa, but he doesn't want just any kind of dog. He wants hounds, and they cost money. Do you know what the Parker boys said they paid for those two hounds they bought? Seventy-five dollars. If I had that much money, I'd buy another mule. Sure do need one. 
I'd overheard this conversation from another room. At first, it made me feel pretty good. At least I was getting to be a problem. Then it didn't feel so good. I knew my mother and father were poor and didn't have any money. I began to feel sorry for them and myself. After thinking it over, I figured out a way to help. Even though it was a great sacrifice, I told Papa, I decided I didn't want the two hounds. One would be enough. I saw the hurt in his eyes. It made me feel like someone squeezing the water out of my heart. Come to the library and check out where the red fern grows and find out if he gets one or two hounds. See you guys.